So now I would like to ask uh, each presenter uh, to respond to read the, uh, the comments and uh, within three minutes. So uh, <laughs> starting from uh, Richard. Well, thank you very much, Louise. Um, I think that as usual with development, we're struggling with um, how to make things work. And in a way, development people are always in a bit of a hurry. They're always trying to make things happen somewhat faster than they otherwise would. But my, my view, I'm a long-term optimist, but a short-term pragmatist. I think you can't move things faster at a certain pace. And I think the thing we should all learn from China is this business of crossing a road by feeling the stones. And I think that what Justin said about the way in which you handle the declining sectors is actually very significant for a lot of countries. I would put more weight than to Justin Howard on the education side of this. I think that if you, one of the secrets of East Asian success is that it was built on strong education foundations. And in a lot of countries, there's a huge investment to make in bringing the skills up to the level where the hard infrastructure can be as productive as, as it is. So I think, and I very much agree also with Louise's point about institutions. In many ways, the, the difficulties are about the functioning of institutions. If, you, if the institutions are, are right, you put quite a lot of resources in. If the institutions aren't right, you can't put a lot of resources in because they won't be used in, in any reasonable way. So, Justin? Okay. Well, you know, basically, I agree with risk comments, and especially on the resource based. And those kind of resource based finance based on in a random line control trial on a very small locations and which are not scaled up possible, right? But uh, anyway, but development need to get some results. And so for that, instead of trying to do the random line control trial, I think it's very important for us to understand the nature of development and to understand the mining country in a country for those kind of structural transformation. And for that, not that my control trial will not work, but certainly we also need to see the results. Then coming to Richard's question about education, agri education is important. However, if you come to an African country, which are the mining country today? I think that you have a lot of educated people that <coughs> have a job. For example, in Ethiopia, they have a very successful story or shoe factory. And now they employ, you know, within three or four years, they employ 8,000 workers already. But if you look into the educational level of the worker there, they are much higher than the educational level of worker in China, on the same factory floor. And that because of the education in Africa has been emphasized for several decades. And they educate a lot of graduate students, and, but they don't have a job. So, I fully agree, especially I'm a student of Theodore Schultz, which is the father of human capital. Mm. I understand education is important, but for African country, mining country today, maybe is how to create those kind of labor intensive job, and which actually does not require so much skill and education. And education for most people in African country today already be sufficient now. Thank you. And Daniel? Well, I have to say I also agree with Louise. Um, I think my kind of four areas of intervention were kind of focused on the institutional capacity development areas. Um, and as someone who works on a lot of USAID projects, I know the pain of reporting on, <laughs> on USAID indicators. And so, so that challenge of trying to invest in kind of long-term institutional capacity and managing short to try impact uh, through indicators to your public is, is the real trade-off, I think. Um, I think Louise's comments raised for me, I think, really an important area that I haven't seen looked at too much is, is why countries are using their sovereign wealth uh, and their debts so differently. Um, and tracing through if there is the institutional reasons for why debt is being managed differently um, throughout the African region. I'm always struck by the comparison between kind of Ghana and Zambia, both in these kind of debt distress, you know, uh, situation that Ghana has been working with the IMF to try to uh, manage its debt in Zambia just threw out the IMF chief uh, last week. So I'm mean, trying to understand what, what, what are the institutional components for how countries are dealing with sovereign wealth that I think is a really important area I haven't seen too many uh, working on. Maybe an area for wider 
<laughs> it's next research project. Thank you very much. So now I would like to uh, open the floor. So from first, yes, yes. <coughs> Okay, uh, Mike Spears from, no, no, mm -hmm. from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Copenhagen, uh, Evaluation and Research Department. Um, what is your definition of structural transformation? Um, while we're sitting here in Helsinki, I think it's uh, 11 hour time difference to California, where Governor Jerry Brown is, uh, has convened a climate action summit. Um, I'm wondering, with all your aid flows and investment, are you really uh, transforming anything at all if you're just going for a traditional uh, model of uh, industrialization and massive infrastructure? Um, I thought clean development was on the agenda, but none of you have touched on it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, please. So I would like to take uh, several questions. Uh, and uh, yeah, please. So, so I also have a question. A question for Justin. I, was, uh, I mean, a lot of your discussion about structural transformation was about labor and capital and investment and, to some extent, markets and development. But I was just wondering what um, what does history tell us with your China and your Vietnam and your Cambodia about how incomes are distributed in your model? And uh, and thinking of those countries, does it mean and does it have any implications for the style of government that's required in order to sort of manage these transformation processes? Yeah, please. Uh, when you talk about private financing, do you talk, talk about export credit or some other other private financing? And also, I was lacking the sustainable development in your talk about the climate and other environmental issues. So please include the next time. Yeah. <clears throat> um, when it comes to structural transformation, I read it that uh, East Asia uh, directed um, the cheap credit to export industries. Uh, um, and also imported uh, the technology that contributed to uh, a very rapid uh, learning process uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and over time also increased uh, private savings a lot. So very much of uh, the finance was from national private savings. We see in Africa extremely low private savings. Um, we see very high bank uh, differentials, uh, interest rate differentials. We see increasing um, uh, uh, loans to uh, households in the cities. We see the, the government borrowing. So, so very little is left actually for industrial development. So, so both uh, uh, Western observers and, and Justin will uh, say that well, we need the, the foreign capital. But but what about uh, harnessing uh, private savings in developing countries as you did in China and uh, well, did in all other East uh, Asian countries? Thank you. So I stop here, and I know that there are several other questions. And uh, second, during second round, I would like to ask. So uh, maybe starting from Justin. Well, I do have a number of questions here. The first one is a definition of structural transformation. And uh, well, I have a new structural economics, so I provide my own definition. Yeah. And uh, first, it's a transformation from agrarian economy to manufacturing-based economy, and then gradually to service-based economy. That's a big structure. And within each sectors, like agriculture, you also have modern technology, and you have traditional technology. And a structure transformation also means to convert from the traditional technology to modern technology. And also, it's in institutions. For example, when you are poor, you have a lot of informal credit. Informal, informal financing. And then when you, you, you are going to the modern industry and so on, you need to rely more gradually to the, you know, uh, 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 the modern financial institution. And uh, similarly, in the legal system, when you are full agrarian economy, basically all the transactions are unlensed. So you don't need to write a contract, you don't have a law enforcement, but if you want to move to the in a modern manufacturing, then you have to contract, you have law enforcement, and so on. All those things related to technology, industries, infrastructure, and institution, they all have some kind of structure there. So that's what I mean, the structural transformation. 
But you want to make structural transformation, not structural adjustment. You know, in the 1980, 1990s, when they tried to have a structural adjustment project, in general, they tried to introduce the modern institution in a high-income country to the developing world. And uh, those kind of institutions may not work because they are not consistent with their protection activity and the risk nature and so on. So if you're interested, you know, I do have something I can share with you. Then coming to the issue of income distribution, you know, according to my new structure economics, and I also am pretty confident to support that. If you follow the competitive advantages in your development process, then you should be able to achieve efficiency and equity simultaneously. Because of poor people, the only source of their income is their own labor force. And in a low income country, a developer industry, according to your comparative advantages, you create more job. And uh, so you can let poor people to share the benefit of development. At the same time, you will be competitive. And that was the situation in East Asian economy from the 1950s to the 1980s, including Japan and uh, Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore. During the very rapid development process, they also improve their income distribution. But uh, coming to the case of China, Vietnam, and uh, Cambodia, you see the rapid economic development, but income distribution wasn't, although they followed their compared advantage in the development. And the reason was because, as I said, they adopt this kind of dual trade approach. On the one hand, continue to retain a lot of distortions to support the old sectors, which create rent and rent shaking. But at the same time, they also develop their light manufacturing efforts that consist of compared advantages. And uh, although they create a lot of jobs, but because of those kind of distortion, favor rich people's income. And so during the process, you see the worsening of the income distribution. If I interest, actually have a Marshall lecture and I analyze that also. And then coming to the cheap credit, you know, that depends on, because during the you know, industrial upgrading and diversification, you need to compensate for the externality of the first movers. And so some kind of incentive would be essential. But those kind of cheap credit and so on will work. Only you are using them to facilitate the growth of the industry which are consistent with your comparative advantage, as probably you see in East Asia. But if you use those cheap credit to support the heavy industries, as you know, African did that, China before 1978 did that, and that did not work. So coming to my question and my recommendation, it's very important to follow the compare advantages and the government play for facilitation law. And if you follow compare advantages, government play a facilitation law, some kind of externality compensation would be essential for the person mover. And cheap credit is one way. Then coming to the low savings in Africa. To me, saving is also endogenous. If you look into the Korea case, before 1960, their saving rate was $20, less than 10%. But during their rapid economic growth period, their saving rate increased to more than 30%. And the reason why was that when you were poor, you know, you don't have so much surplus. So you can shoot more, and you don't have anything to save. But if you follow your dynamic process as I described, you move the worker to the manufacturing sector which is competitive. They have income, and uh, the investment in a sector which are consistent with your comparative advantages can generate very high return. They have more to save, and they will have higher save, high incentive to save. Again, in my 2007 Marshall Lecture at Cambridge University, I also provide evidence for that. Thank you. So, Daniel, you have... I think on structural transformation. Okay. I look yeah. to the, to the Any other? Richard or? Uh, yeah. 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 Oh, uh, I think I would like uh, Richard to address the question as export credit. Yeah, the export credit question. I mean, I think, I think if it's underwritten by the government, even if it's provided by a bank, which is the British system, it still counts ultimately as a government liability, and therefore it counts as official. I'd like here to welcome what Justin was saying about the need for a this bigger definition. It's not that we shouldn't continue to have official development assistance, but we need to take care of all this official support for sustainable development. Indeed, the OECD has a big project with the UN on measuring total official support for sustainable development, TOSSD. And this is partly because the OECD itself has been very bad at measuring any of these other official flows, these less concessional official transactions. They're becoming more important relatively, and we need better accounting for that. And that will also show 
where governments really are making an effort, not just with highly concessional money, but also with its less concessional flows. Sustainability, somebody should say something about. The two kinds of sustainability, in my view, are important. In the 1970s, we used to pretend that all we had to do was build capital projects in, say, Africa. And I was involved with building roads in Nepal, for example. These roads were never maintained. And the Nepalese government approach was, well, five years later, we'll come back and you can rebuild the road. Yeah. So I'm, I'm quite skeptical in very poor countries of a policy which is just about capital projects, because you've got to think about the sustainability in the sense of maintenance. And I think that's something that, therefore, my view is that you need a balance of capital and recurrent flows to countries where the tax base is extremely low. And that's been the rationale for balance of payments assistance, for budget support, for ways of getting recurrent finance into the system, because countries need a balance between capital and recurrent. That's one kind of sustainability. The same kind of sustainability is the saving the planet sustainability. I do think those of us living in the North need to recognize that most of the planet's problems have been caused by us rather than by Africa. And we need to be very careful about trying to hold the Africans to higher standards than we apply to ourselves. At the same time, it's in Africa's interest to put in place long-lasting infrastructure which is built to the right kind of standards and will stand up to climate change and the rest of it. So I think the dialogue about sustainability needs to recognise those two kinds and to avoid any sort of, you know, we may have made mistakes, but you're going to get it right, aren't you, approach, which is not, in my view, at all sensible. Just one comment to say, Justin, I'm not against RCTs or uh, evaluation research or generally research on development projects and what works and why. I think that kind of research is really important. I just worry about, you know, paying for performance uh, ignores uh, general equilibrium effects. And I'll give you an example. My, the institution, it's always good to pick on your previous employer than your current employer. <laughs> so I'm going to pick on my previous employer, which is the World Bank. Uh, who gave a, um, uh, who financed a social impact bond in, I think, West Bank and Gaza, conditional on certain types of people getting jobs. And the only thing is, there was no expansion of industry or, or, or firms, so it's only a question of how the jobs will be, that was a social impact bond around redistributing jobs, not creating jobs. Uh, because the uh, fallacy of composition, the general equilibrium effect was ignored. So those are the kind of things that I worry about. Thank you very much. So, yeah, please. Thank you. Uh, I have two questions. One is regarding safe and, uh, safety and quality of uh, those infrastructure projects. I, I don't know whether you have heard about a uh, dam collapse in Laos, which was financed by Korean or the young, by the way, Korean. And I've been looking into that project. And one of the things which also you mentioned about climate change and we talk about sustainability is because um, the it's PPP project, the first ever by the Korean government, and it's a mixture of so many diverse actors and contractors. So it's contractors, subcontractors. And how are we going to manage that kind of what you mentioned about liability? We have official financing going in, not just Korea, but Thailand as well. And how are we to, I mean, we have global partnership in SDG, and you know, where, where are the, we can't really even see the transparency, who, why it happened. Um, so that's my first question to all the panel. I think dam is collapsing, there's bridge collapse, and I think the J Japanese or the project world bridge also collapsed during the construction. So we're now in this particular environment, all context. And second one is about the structure transformation we, you, we all mentioned. I would like to mention the politics of it. Um, the kind of, whenever I look at my Korean ODA, it looks like who's Structural transformation is this ODA or ADS for? So my question to you, the panel. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, one question to Richard, but also the rest of the panel. Uh, as you showed very nicely, uh, so IDA funds are increasing, but at the same time, the number of IDA countries is shrinking. And the remaining group of IDA countries tends to be those with worse institutions. So how do you then keep IDA making a positive impact? And perhaps also a bit to this whole question of how do you evaluate in, this, in, in such a context? Because if you constantly need to demonstrate a success, that might not work in these environments. You may need to take bigger risks. And is any of the ODA, ODA world really set up? So despite a lot of confessions to the contrary, to really take 
risks of failure in such contexts. Yeah. I'm Johan Kopenen from the University of Helsinki. And I think that we have been now heard quite a lot about financing, but if you are talking of continuities and changes in development policy, I think it's also to think a little bit more about contents. About, about the contents of financing, yeah. about uh, what is how, how the funds are being allocated for, for which purposes they are, they are being used. And I wonder if there's anything really new happening in this respect in development policy, or is it more or less uh, no, no, more of the same, or in the best case, some of those things which have been done before and are now returning in cycles. For instance, do we have do we have something uh, something essentially new in SDGs? One one could argue that they are actually, uh, in spite of all rhetoric about the deserts, they, they, they are a combination of two different agendas. There is really the poverty eradication, poverty reduction agenda for for poorer countries, and uh, you know that's the direct development financing is needed. And then the, then the other agenda is the one which I would call system. Agenda for sustainable growth for us. So, so, how do we make our own growth sustainable? Which is not so much question of developing finance. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So, starting from our Richard. Or yeah, Rick? Okay. Uh, well, I think that anybody involved in, uh, in major construction projects has to take safety extremely seriously. And uh, I think questions need to be asked when these things go wrong. So they've been asked in Italy for this bridge collapse in Genoa, which was put in the 1960s. And it appears that I was talking to my father-in-law who's an engineer. And apparently anything where oxygen and, and water can get together is, is, of course, extremely bad for steel. Apparently in Britain, all the, all the suspension bridges have to have enclosed in nitrogen for that reason to keep the oxygen out but I mean th these are these are things that people have to get right and whatever the structure there's got to be no compromise on safety I think was the answer to that on the I think you raise a very uh, fair point I mean what will IDA look like in a few years time as I've said already the donors having set up these elaborate ways of measuring performance with a view to rewarding performance are now saying oh but you must spend x percent on fragile states because donors are for strategic reasons worried about al-qaeda in the Sahel and the rest of it um, and this is putting the MDBs in, in a situation where there will be more failures, I would think. And as we all know, the, the problems of the more fragile societies are not going to be solved by cash. You know, there's, there's much more needed than that. And one has to look carefully at what can in practice be done in the Yemen, let's say. You know, this, isn't, this is not something that's amenable to, um, to throwing large amounts of money at it, even though large amounts of money will certainly be needed at some stage. So I think this problem will be increasingly discussed. Is, is my answer to your question. And on the content, well, you've seen a kind of, you're quite right to say all these fashions come and go. I mean, in the 1980s, my main job in Britain was to sell stuff to China uh, on mixed credit, which we did rather successfully. And China made quite good use of it, and some other countries made rather bad use of it. And all the British firms involved went bust in the end, and then none of them exist anymore. Uh, and then we had the Helsinki Agreement, and the infrastructure became much harder to finance in that way. And as a result, there was a big drop in infrastructure financing. It became politically more convenient to say we were pushing a health and other agenda. Health funding went up a lot, still pretty high as you saw from the giants. Uh, that's left an infrastructure deficit which China and the Millennium Challenge Corporation and others are, are now seeking to fill. So you can't trust donor fashions is my answer to your question. My, my view is all countries need everything. You know, they've got to pay the police, but it's unlikely that donors are going to set up a fund just to pay the police force. So donors also have constituents to deal with, so it's convenient for some donors to support some things and other donors to support another. I don't think the Chinese government are criticised in China for being big on infrastructure. If the British government's big on infrastructure, we'd be criticised all over the place for all sorts of reasons. So, you know, this has to reflect the dynamics within the, within the donor country as well. Yeah, I think, uh, by the way, um uh, one of the criticisms of Chinese infrastructure finance is that it's turnkey. Uh, and I'm not sure that's such a relevant criticism, um, given the problems, as you describe, uh, for a poor uh, or government with the lower capacity to manage all the complex aspects of infrastructure, design, construction, supervision, 
um, et cetera. Uh, however, there's also a criticism that in those turnkey projects, they get over-engineered because what the, the firm that is building them, you know, it's like, you know, when you get your house fixed and you say to the guy who's doing it, you know, my budget is a maximum of $50,000. And it says yes. Well, you end up paying, you know, a hundred because uh, these change orders keep showing up, right? And that's what happens in infrastructure financing too. Um, now, but at the same time, um, you know, the people have also criticized uh, the World Bank where there's like extensive resource, uh, you know, a separate firm is hired to supervise the construction, blah, 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 as being too slow and therefore ending up costing money because time is money. So I don't think uh, there's the, uh, I don't think there's, this is the right approach that government should take to infrastructure design, uh, construction, and finance. I think it needs to be looked at and applied to the situation. And uh, my government is also a uh, fan of these PPP projects, but they do have their complexity. I think the risk tolerance question is extremely important. I've been in two development institutions. Both of them have tried to adopt new policies for risk. I was at the World Bank when they had this ORAF come in, this overall risk framework you were supposed to do on projects. And, oh, that's great. I thought we can, we can show uh, what the risks are. And the, so I was, I happened to be, I didn't, working on a project at that time. We said, this is the risk. And then management came back and says, well, how are you going to mitigate it? And I went, oh yeah, okay, you don't really want to know the risks. And it turned out they didn't, really, you know, the risks, these matrices became very banal event, uh, after the first round, right? Um, the USAID is now trying to develop a risk appetite. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, it's going through the same. And so I do think this question of risk tolerance in fragile states is going to be constant evolving and especially as aid agencies are subject to increased scrutiny. Uh, while the agency itself may have risk tolerance within its management, um, the scrutiny of outsiders uh, will limit its risk tolerance as well. So it's the authorizing environment in which these agencies work uh, that matters as much. Oh. When I come to the infrastructure project implementation, and uh, you know, it's very important to have a right management models to start with. Yes, right. and, but that depends on you know, your institutional capacity to begin with. For example, in 1985, before 1985, China did not have highway at all. Now China has 125,000 kilometers of highway the longest in the whole world. But it all started one project in 1985, a link from Beijing to Tianjin and to the port. That's 300 kilometers, very short. But that project was a training for China. China borrowed the money from the World Bank, but not because of the money case, to learn how to manage, starting from project preparation, starting from how to arrange funding, how to collect total, and how to do the repayment. And then, the dirt, and then all other highway in China, just students of that project. But China can do that you know, just by technological you know, advice from the World Bank, because in the institutional capacity in China has been very high. But there's another model. Recently, China helped the Ethiopia to contract the railroad from you know, Addis Ababa to Djibouti. And the arrangement was that for every job, there's a Chinese engineer, Chinese managers, and also an Ethiopian manager right. work together. Right. And the goal was within 10 years, the whole management will be transported back to the Ethiopian. And I think based on that, mm -hmm. Ethiopian will have the capacity to do yeah. their railway role and so on. So, but to start with high standard and then make this kind of long-term investment sustainable, would be very essential. So I guess I'll just um, address the, the last question about allocation of financing. You were asking about distribution within ODA. Um, and I've only looked at, uh, for Africa, so I'm not sure globally how it looks, but, and I did allude to some of it up here. And I think, I mean, what is, 
quite interesting is you have seen a decline for education. As I mentioned, you've seen a decline for public administration, public finance, and more broadly for governance and civil society. Even as you've seen quite a large increase among the DAC, I don't know if it's following or if it's just in parallel, um, but for infrastructure, um, for the productive sector, so for, for agriculture and for manufacturing, um, and then still quite high for health. Um, so you are seeing some, some type of shift um, that might be kind of mirroring you know, some, of the, some, of the, some of the new goals for the sustainable development goals, this interest more in innovation infrastructure. Um, but I think what's worrying for this conversation is this decline in governance, civil society support. Um, if we keep saying we need the capacity to manage infrastructure projects and um, other types of government capacity, it's, it's quite worrying that you're seeing that, that decline in the governance sector. Um, and so just as a plug for tomorrow, we will be having a panel um, with some of the participants here in the room looking at uh, why we seem such a backsliding in democracy in Africa and if that's tied to some of the shift in the financial landscape. Thank you very much. Um, toward the uh, achieving the SDGs, there are so many uh, issues to be tackled and uh, uh, both development and developing and developed countries at agencies, international institutions, and private sectors has different roles. And I think that uh, uh, the uh, aid policy is still uh, very important. And I think that we had a very uh, interesting and lively discussion today. And thank you very much for panelists and discussants. And uh, thank you all for participating in today's seminar. <laughs>